One more time. <laughs> yeah, this is in Colorado, and they actually constructed this factory and the smokestacks just for this. Which seems like a waste of money, but it's this is so satisfying. Wait, just so they can do that? Why? There's an old factory. <laughs> That'd be a big waste of money. And why am I wearing a poppy, by the way? It's Veterans Day. And it's kind of gone out of fashion, and now it seems like, a, since I watched the NFL game yesterday, it seems just basically they sell overpriced jerseys with bad camouflage on them. Let me rephrase that. That's all the NFL is trying to do. Their salute to service it kind of makes me sick. But but uh, this, when I was kid, almost everyone wore a poppy on this day. If you go to Britain and Canada, they wear poppies for the entire month. And every Everybody wears a poppy. So you see Parliament, they're all wearing a poppy until today. And Veterans Day, before Veterans Day, anybody know what it was called? It was Armistice Day. Because why November 11th? Not World War II. Yeah. World War One ended. In fact, they actually fought, arguably for four more days, but for sure, one more day. So they could get the dramatic ending of the, the war to end all wars, which is sad, tragic, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. And that's why it's November 11th. After World War II, they changed it to Veterans Day because well, it turned out to not be the war day of all wars. And in Britain, for example, it's Remembrance Day. Same in France, you know, that kind of thing. And France has other symbols, you know, because you can imagine much of the war, at least the Western Rome's fought in France. You ever know why a poppy? Okay, poppies, they grow Especially in Western Europe, they grow almost like wheat. They're yellow, they're red, they're white. I think they're pretty, pretty flowers. And they just, I mean, they pop up and bloom overnight. They're pretty remarkable plants. And but they only grow on freshly churned up soil, meaning soil that would be where? What's that? On a freshly, freshly grub, uh, grave, yeah. So just the graves where they dug you know, as quick as they could. They tried to bury the bodies, and there'd just be a sea of pond. So to remember those who died from war. So I, I think it's very fitting, and I always try to remember that to try to learn that. And so, <laughs> don't think about something else might happen. So let's get to the actual fight, the 1882-83 tariff battle. We're talking about democracy, the spoil system, all these amazing things. But to Calhoun and Jackson, they really revolved around these issues. So in 1832, remember the tariff of They actually cut it in 1832. Jackson signed the bill, but it wasn't enough of a cut. Let's be honest. Calhoun wanted a fight. Calhoun wanted to unify the South. Actually, Calhoun either wanted to intimidate the United States or get them to overreact. But they still, so this is an election year, 1833, South Carolina issued the Ordinance of Nullification. Now, this cartoon shows the Southern point of view. So here is in the South, and he's skinny, they're starving, they're being crushed by tariffs and taxes, the ships are not moving, so there's no sales, to let means to rent. And that's always a good sign that people aren't doing well. They've got to rent out or sell what they have. While in the north, their business is booming. And they would show wealth, especially this time with somebody who's a little bit heavy. The idea being they eat a lot of it because they have a lot of money. And so that is a cartoon. So what they said is the tariff will not be collected in South Carolina's main port, Charleston. They won't collect. The state won't allow it. I mean, this is a direct attack on the United States. Because remember, the point of this is to unify the South, but if the federal government makes them, tries to make them get rid of nullification and collect the tariff, what was that? Charleston. The U.S. won't let them do Yeah. That? If the U.S. tries to stop them from nullifying the tariff and make them enforce the tariff, Who's that? South Carolina. Oh. Then South Carolina will do what? So this is threatening war. 
And then the Nashville, in Nashville, supporters of Calhoun wanted all Southern states to get together to unify and throw out the tariff. But remember, yeah, they don't like the tariff, but the big thing is Calhoun's making like a Southern party that will protect slavery, therefore protect the union. That's Calhoun's goal. He thinks the only way to protect the union is to have the South together to defend slavery. But in it, almost immediately, he's threatening war. And everybody knows it. If the state can nullify a federal law, the union is crushed. And if the state leaves, it's over. There's no way to salvage the union. Everybody knows secession equals war. So this is a dangerous game. I also showed that um, Calhoun just sees it as just very simple. Either I get everything I want or we blow everything up. And how do you suppose Jackson's reaction was to all this? Anybody want to guess what the first thing he said? He heard about the nullifiers, they were called. He saw them as traitors. His first reaction was, of course, by all damnation, I'll hang them all. And he vowed to lead an army to South Carolina and hang every nullifier. And he was furious. And that is going to lead to the series of events that nearly led to war. But arguably, all started by South Carolina. Not argue, started by South Carolina. Jackson, in his fury, demanded a force bill. And the force bill would be to use the armed forces, if necessary, to make South Carolina follow federal law. And Congress passed it, and Jackson vowed to lead it. I mean, this was, this basically followed the carrot and stick method. And there's cartoons showing South Carolina ripping apart the Union. But Jackson, in his fury, he's, he's portrayed in, throughout history like a guy with uncontrollable rage. No, he was not. Jackson was angry and despised Calhoun and those people, those rich plantation owners. But... But he also, in the bill, they would use the Navy to collect the tariff just outside of the harbor, at sea, avoiding an armed conflict over the tariff until a compromise could be met. So Jackson threatened force and then used the Navy. Now, to be clear, this just barely started. The U.S. Navy is tiny. The U.S. basically has no army. But then in secret... Jackson began negotiating for another compromise tariff that would even cut the tariff of 1832 by half. So another cut in the tariff. So Jackson is using the true carrot to stick. Force bill, compromise tariff. But Calhoun is convinced he's on the edge of victory. I am going to get everything I want. And as he sees it, at first, Calhoun thinks this is good. He thinks the South will get angry because of the force bill and unify in Nashville. And so, the compromise tariff passed the House, but Calhoun, who resigned from the Vice Presidency and the South Carolina State Assembly, immediately sent him back as the Senator from South Carolina. I mean, immediately, right back. He, overconfident, would turn down that bill, saying the South would not support it, and it died in the Senate. And the National Convention, yeah. He turned down the bill. No, the uh, compromise tariff. The force bill did pass. Calhoun actually wanted it, but Calhoun didn't understand something. How did the rest of the South react to South Carolina just doing this? Huh. You're going to lead us in the Civil War. Not only that, they heard what Jackson said, and they believed him, and they're scared of Jackson. Oh, I almost forgot. In the Nashville Convention, they chose Nashville because what state's Nashville in? And who has their plantation called the Hermitage right outside of Nashville? Jackson. This is a slap in the face to Jackson. So other southern states hear Jackson's response of, I'm going to hang you all, but hang you all. And, Jack, and they're thinking, I don't want to be hanged. And I believe Jackson means it. Jackson will save the Union. And so Calhoun turns this down. They think they're on the edge of victory, and the rest of the South panics, and the convention falls apart. Nobody goes. It's a disaster, a humiliating defeat. So here's a pro-Calhoun cartoon 
showing nullification, South, uh, South Carolina ordinance, civil war deception, all the way up to despotism. despotism. And it's implying here's Jackson reaching for the crown to make himself a tyrant. And so only the South can save him. So you have the two different points of view. And so Henry Clay would negotiate another compromise tariff. This one actually didn't cut as rates as much as Jackson's because Clay actually liked the tariff. But now the South is defeated and it passes. Calhoun gives in. This is a humiliating defeat for South Carolina and the South. And the rest of the South is looking at South Carolina going, you're going to lead us into war. In fact, the joke was after nullification that South Carolina is way too small for a state and way too big for an insane asylum. Why was South Carolina leading the way here and they would be the first state to secede in 1861? Say it again. They're already called <laughs> That part of it, they already were the most radical. But the biggest reason, they have the highest percentage of slaves of any state. That means more big slaveholders and a greater fear of what? Every state that left the Union first in the Civil War had the highest percentage of slaves. Yes? Why didn't Calhoun pass the slaves? We didn't pass the agreed to excuse me. He realized he's all alone. When the rest of the states didn't go to Nashville, so he agreed to it. The way the Senate rules back then, one senator could basically stop a bill, which is kind of crazy, but because we're not much different now. But that's, so we basically agreed. It's kind of funny, though. South Carolina, though, defeated. They turned around and nullified the force bill. You know, that's like, we'll show you. Yeah. There's my voice. Which, of course, Jackson's like, whatever. We, you're totally defeated. But here's the issue with that. A couple fold. First off, nullification is defeated. Nullification could no longer be used as a way for the South to defend slavery. But the problem is, to many of the hardliners, soon to be called fire eaters, nullification gone, that leads only secession to their point. And when the next really big crisis would come up, and that's in 1850, the first thing they did, they jumped the gun, not for nullification, but right to secession. And then in 1860, when Lincoln was elected president, in the five months before he's inaugurated, South Carolina starts to see, and the rest of the Deep South did. So, you can argue, in fact, I believe this, the Union was saved, and Jackson deserves the majority of the credit. Here is a song called Jackson and the Fires, and this is a shockingly long poem slash song. And I looked at the words, and my guess is all of you are expecting a really bad song. It's worse than you think. <laughs> but, and also show Jackson's point of view. This is a great cartoon from the beginning of the Civil War. And in this one, here's Calhoun, Calhoun's trying to demand all nullification. Here's Jackson. By the eternal, the Union must be preserved. Crashing down. Yet in 1860, when South Carolina seceded, the president, James Buchanan, did nothing to stop him and was so scared of assassination, he literally hid under his desk in the Oval Office. So here's the, the South standing down the United States. There was no Jackson in 1861. I like that cartoon. I'm glad I found that. And so with that, yeah, Jackson arguably saved the Union. He's a complex guy. And there's my picture of Jackson. That's in New Orleans. So the Battle of New Orleans, you can imagine there'll be a statue of Jackson. That's on Jackson Square in front of St. Charles Church. And the standard this is the old French Quarter. So if, if I'm looking this way from where the picture is, the Missouri River just or the Mississippi is just 150 yards away, 100 yards away, not even that. Really cool area of town. And this is all for the Battle of New Orleans. But during the Civil War, when the United States took New Orleans, kind of shocked everybody, the biggest town in the Confederacy in 1862, General Butler, the commander of Union forces there, had this carved into the statue of Jackson as a slap in the face of the Confederacy. The Union must and shall be preserved. The statue they have up there for his battle of New Orleans. And they tried, actually, the city of New Orleans, they, they're, they're threatening to remove that in the 1880s and 1890s, and again in the 1950s. But it's still there. Pretty darn good picture, huh? You notice how I've composed the shot? They got that in front. See, isn't that beautiful with the clouds? Just, I mean, I, I don't like to brag about my photographic eye, but let me rephrase that. 
I took the camera and I just snapped and held it down, took about eight pictures, and that one turned out really good. <laughs> That's how you become a good photographer. Yes? Um, so the tariff, like 1832, is that like the forest bill and the compromise tariff? Mm -hmm. And then that's also the notification. Yeah, it all fits into the same thing. And that was really the edge of Civil War. If there would have been Civil War in 1833, the South would have won, without a doubt. That was also the South Carolina Expedition. It starts with that, yeah. And I put that on there because like, I might just have like a multiple choice question with the South Carolina Exposition of protests as mentioned. But the whole thing is a you know, big issue. The, it's part of a bigger picture. Yeah. So that, we got to get to the bank. Well, before we get to that, we got to get to a little bit of Jacksonian economics. Because Jacksonian economics, it was not a clear set economic idea. Like policy, I meant to say. But it was an idea. And it's this. Economics are political. Governments make the rules. They create the currency. They allow companies to become monopoly or say, no, you can't have a monopoly. They can, governments can rig the system for one or two people or make it, make it fair for everybody. So to the Jacksonians point of view, if it's political and we have a democracy, that means the people ultimately decide. The people have a voice in the economy. Remember, laissez-faire economics, conservative economics, don't mess with competition. Jacksonian economics, no, the people have every right because it's a democracy. And so this cartoon lays out Jacksonian democracy. It's one of my favorite ones, and I think you can immediately see why I enjoy this cartoon so much. So it's Jackson and the head of the bank, Nicholas Biddle, doing bare knuckle boxing, which it's hard to find a more brutal sport than bare knuckle boxing. Basically, they fight until someone does it. You get my point? And if you don't swing, if you're not swinging, you're out. You lose. So they basically just swing. Got Men die of exhaustion sometimes. So with this, there's Jackson fighting Biddle, and these are some of the very wealthy people behind him. For example, okay, wealthy, and she's carrying port. It's kind of a sweet wine that was really a drink of the very wealthy. And then here's Webster and Henry Clark, so really prominent wings, cheering on the Bank of the United States. Here's Jackson with, okay, there's Van Buren, who is known as a wily politician, so he's kind of like this, uh, crafty. But, Here's a soldier, and then here is a frontiersman, a westerner, a commoner, drinking old, old hickory whiskey. So it's just a working man's drink, which is kind of funny, but we're just the whiskey like a commoner would drink. And we know he's a commoner, and we know he represents democracy. Why? Obviously, anybody with a cat on their hat, eating cheese, mind you, that's democracy. I don't know why he's got a cat on his head. <laughs> but it's awesome. The question is, why don't all of you have cats on your head? And secondly, I think it has something to do with a commoner's how it's more and more become a coonskin cap, which would have the tail of a raccoon. And that would seem as a kind of a westerner, but I don't know if it's that either. I think. It's just awesome. So it's either he has a either he's wearing the cap or the cat is riding him. I don't know which is which. But <laughs> for some reason, just why? But the word, it's so hard to read that. I can't get it big enough to ever read what they say. Political cartoons back then would tell these huge stories. So a couple of things about it. They feared capitalism, not because they feared the market. They feared the capital being in the hands of just a few. But not only that, monopolies. They feared monopoly power as they could see it. People that believed in yeah, they feared. And they saw that as monopoly concentrating wealth and power. You know, a few very wealthy people running everything. They'd even become president. And then, tied onto this was they feared speculation. Because speculation led to debt. Now, do you remember what speculation is? In land, you buy the land, win. <laughs> Try to say it again. And then you do what? Sell it for more. Yeah, and you can do that with like stocks or bonds, but land speculation. And to Jackson, speculation jacked the prices up. We got to control that because it's hurting working people or farmers. So he wanted hard money. He thought the best way to control the amount of money in circulation, hard money, that specie. Remember, remember what specie is? Gold yeah, gold and silver, as opposed to paper currency. He thought the bank, 
issuing a bunch of paper currency was fueling speculation, raising prices. And when the bubble burst, everyone suffered to suffer a few rich people. That's what he saw it as. And that's an element of truth there. And so he thought government should control to help everybody. The term for helping everybody back then was the common wheel. You ever heard of the common wealth or the common good? Common wheel. It's kind of too bad that it's gone. I'm glad it's written that I thought that was kind of cool. The common wheel for all people. Now, I just put this in quotes because this was a Jacksonian idea. All of us have, he thought, we have the same value, the same purpose, we should have the same destiny, meaning that all people should benefit from, uh, from American prosperity, not just a few. How you achieve that, they weren't sure. And some of his ideas were, were pretty shaky. So we're talking more of this basic idea, helping or everybody should have the same chance Everybody should have or share in the public good, but the big thing is pure monopolies. And this would become this concept would be the beginnings of liberal economics. But they never really had an economic policy yet. They're not socialists, even though they do prescribe more to socialism than other ideas, but they're not really there. And there's involving cats, and we're not done with cats yet. This all relies on, therefore, the bank war. The bank war would personify all of Jackson's economic ideas and lay out the fear of concentrated wealth in this country. And Jackson saw that he's fighting for common man, democracy, against the big money, and they always push this idea of this amorphous Eastern elite. This is a picture of the first bank of the United States. It's kitty corner from the White House. And by the 1830s, they're starting to call it the White House. Now it's a private bank. It's it's called the federal style, but it's, you might have heard it called classical style too. They call them like a like a Greek column. And go there today. It's really cool. It's a marble building. It's it's a private bank now. Just a regular, not the bank of the U.S. I think it's yeah, it's the first national bank now. And go in and ask for samples. They give you money. It's really cool. Actually, it's really cool, literally, because it's marble. But that was Jackson's idea. Marble keeps everything cold. Go into a marble building when it's really hot outside. Who lives in a marble house? Am I the only one? I got a good deal. In Washington, D.C., the first time I went to, this was actually at the Library of Congress, but it was Washington, D.C. in the summer, the average temperature is about a million degrees. And that's including the wind chill. But I walked into the Library of Congress and it's marble, and there's no air conditioning, and it was like cold. Ooh, marble is awesome. But I could imagine in winter it might be a negative. Moving on. So this is going to be many times, another one of these fights between two people, but that's really not quite true. Here's Bill, the president of the bank, and what does he look like? 13, you think? And then there's Jackson. To Jackson's point of view, there's too much power in the bank. Because the bank's contract said they issued currency, money backed by US government tax receipts. They issue currency. They can control the money supply. And that kind of power can raise and lower prices. That kind of power can make or break the economy. And to Jacksonian point of view, that is totally unfair because where does he get his power? It's a huh? Yeah, he is not elected. So this concentration of power in a not elected person, and who gives him his power? Stockholders. Stockholders are people who own this new thing that literally just been invented in Belgium, of all places. What is a corporation? It is a corporation, and we have to do everything to change that to a corporation. Yeah. Wait, what does this have to do with the Biddle? The Biddle dude? Well, he's the head of the bank. And the head of the bank was chosen by stockholders. Okay. And he's not elected. All that power in the hands of a not elected person. And Jackson said, couldn't he do this for own personal profit and personal gain? Why does a stockholder buy share in a company, the Bank of the United States? Because they want to do what? So, 
speculate. Yeah, make money down the road. Not for the public good or the public wheel. This is for personal profit. And Jackson says, Jackson is saying this represents everything that's wrong. We gotta stop this. So with that, in 1832, there's an election. Yay, election. And same it, no location is just growing up. Any removal is just starting. This is an amazing time period in American history. 1832 is one of those that it kind of there's other things happen and people forget. Henry Clay is going to run for president again, and he thinks everybody loves the bank. The bank's charter, the contract has to be renewed by Congress in 1836. Clay thinks, let's do it now. Four years early, make it an issue, because Clay thinks everybody wants the bank. Now, of course, Clay only talks to people who agree with him, kind of like Calhoun thought, talked to people who only agreed in the National Convention. He wanted to force Jackson into a, a box or into a corner, kind of like the tariff of abominations. If Jackson signs the bill, Jackson looks like a hypocrite for opposing the bank. If he vetoes it, then Clay could say Jackson's going against a really popular program. And what did Jackson do? By vetoing it, Clay thought he had it. In fact, he thought he silenced the general. See it? Here's Clay holding Jackson down using a needle and thread to sew Jackson's mouth shut. That is one gruesome cartoon. Yeah, Clay thought he had him. In fact, Jackson would use the veto 12 times more than any other president. In fact, Jackson issued more vetoes than all the previous presidents combined. And the first president to use it as a political threat. I oppose that bill, and I'm going to veto it unless you change the bill, which are what all presidents do now. Current presidents do not veto bills very often. They just threaten to, to get a change. And so his opponent said Jackson was a tyrant. I showed you this cartoon before, but this is why. You ever seen a picture of like a king or a queen and they hold in one hand a scepter and then an orb. And the orb is where their power comes from. Usually it's kind of a, a, a some kind of symbol, usually a, um, a sphere. But what's his orb? The veto. And that allows him to stand on the Constitution. That's what's here. So that's saying he's a tyrant. A pro Jackson one, I'm sorry, I, I can't, I gotta get a better copy of this, but I tried to stretch it out, I got too pixelated. So the, the, it's just not a very good copy. It's Jackson as a big cat, chewing up all the rats, AKA those who want the bank, to protect the people. And actually what it's supposed to be like a granary so the rats don't go in and eat all the food. So Jackson as a cat. So we're back to the cat. Then he jumps on a hat. Uh, yeah. The poetry never ends in So, did it win for Clay? It was a disaster. Clay had no idea what regular people wanted. Clay was an elite. And they loved Jackson. Now, did the people hate the bank? Nah, maybe not. But Jackson thought so. He won a huge victory, one of the biggest in history up to that time. Okay, a, a victory not involving Washington or more than one party. And he saw this as a mandate to destroy the bank. You know what South Carolina? South Carolina voted for Floyd. And the reason why he was a congressman from there, the whole issue was nullification. They were not going to vote for Jackson. That's why. That was just purely a protest vote. Now, South Carolina would be known for this because they're in South Carolina. Who's been to South Carolina? Field trip? You guys hop on a bus, I'll meet you there. That'd only be a few days, drive day and night, day and night. Moving on. So Jackson, to destroy the bank, pulled all the government receipts out of it. So taxpayer money was supposed to go to the bank to back up currency, but also so they could loan to other banks. Jackson turned around and put it in state chartered banks that were dubbed pet banks, like his pet, you know, because he could put government money in there. So all of a sudden, all these state banks had all this money. There was no real system. This is where Jackson's problem, or Jackson's uh, a mistake. He didn't have a plan. He just knew he didn't trust the bank. And he had good reason to. Here's a pro-Jackson cartoon. 
And it's Jackson issuing that to destroy the bank. Here's you know, God. Huzzah! But remember the, the column that shows you on the Bank of the U.S.? Here they come tumbling down. And these are all the wigs and pro bank people running, but who else is there? Beelzebub. Don't be afraid. Don't say that name twice, right? No, it's a three times. I'll do it. I'll do it here. So with that, yes, the devil. I love the old devil. I mean, I drove us kind of this hairy beast. I miss that devil. Then they start later on. They start drawing it as kind of the devil. What a weird thing to say. Have you ever heard anybody say, "I miss that devil"? Yes, unique. So with that, <laughs> well, with no real controls over the money, all these banks that were kind of outside the system, and that's why they were called. Here we come again with another cat, another cat, a wildcat banks. This would feel all these risky loans. They started loaning money like mad. And basically, there's no control. It, be, it became a free-for-all that Jackson partially set by pulling the money out. He didn't have a plan. This would fuel land speculation. A huge bubble form where prices started going up and up and up and up. And people were borrowing money and buying land. And everyone thought the prices are going to go up and go up. And how long would the prices go up? Whenever there's a bubble, people believe the bubble will go on forever. And so they borrow and buy, borrow and buy, borrow and buy. And what happens when it pops? When people also realize that the prices are overvalued, what happens? <laughs> prices tank and can people pay their loans back? That's what happened in your lifetime in 2007, 2008, the great financial panic of 2008. But before we get to that, Biddle, in his fury, decided to show the importance of the bank. And he started taking money out of circulation. And that's one of the currencies that came from the bank. He started to pull money out just at a time where we had this weird fuel or speculation fueled by debt. He was purposely creating deflation that would destroy the economy. Why? To prove the importance of the bank. And this would trigger, in today's term, we'd say a recession that would have been eventually a financial panic, which did not kind of prove exactly what Jackson said, that he would do it for personal gain. OK, you want to see a weird cartoon. Here's Webster, Clay, William Henry Harrison, and they're going over the patient is the bank. And here he is trying to get him to recover as he pukes out gold coin. I'm not really sure exactly what it means, but it's kind of repulsive. I mean, that's, okay, that's gross. What is this specky circle? So, Jackson would respond with the species circular. Does that help? Yes. And the species circular was this. Okay, we got speculation. And this would be a bad move by Jackson without a doubt. Federal land which is opening up in the West. And this is why that guy said, I'm off to Illinois. Can only buy with specie, gold and silver coin. Jackson wanted to create deflation because there's a limited amount of gold and silver. If people don't have a lot of gold and silver to buy government land, that means prices for all lands will tank. And that will pop the bubble. And prices tumble. And that would lead to the panic. And that would be the final trigger for the panic of 1837. Yeah. Um, that 1836, that's the year that they started taking money in circulation. Actually, Bill started doing that about 1834. And so the, the they, they didn't keep track of the numbers then, but you could the economy was probably already in really bad shape by 36, but the panic would start in 37. Yeah. In your lifetime, the economy started tanking in, in 2007. But the panic didn't hit until 2008. October. So we go back to that? I can't. And we're coming to this panic of 1837. Last thing. We already kind of mentioned what happened, but this horrible economic panic. And the main cause is speculation in land, but also railroads. The deflation caused by Biddle and the species circular. 
would lead to massive bank failures and an economic recession. I should add, specie circular, this is a specie clause. And this is a father, it's supposed to be, you know, empty plate, they're starving to death because of the panic. And here comes the bank to foreclose on their home. So this is an anti-Jackson, even though it happened during Van Buren's presidency. Got it. Oh, almost forgot. The last thing on the review list, the lock cabin and the hard cider campaign will not be on the test. I thought I'd get there, I didn't get there. I blame, who should I blame? I blame those two. Um, would you lie? No. Okay, it's all you. People started investing in the railroads. <laughs> so the old thing. When we get to actually cool cuts, I'll actually explain to you like we get to 1873 exactly how it and it happens every time, including the one in your lifetime. You're being good at this. Well done. Off the wall. Well played. Oh, yeah. uh, a panic of 1837. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yeah. So I'm just throwing that out. Okay, so let's check out the list for the. Oh, I went through most of the show already. People are doing okay, but I just haven't done the multiple choice. The matching. Uh, can I grab a paper towel? Yes. Quick card. I'm sure it was like. Are we going to immediately pick that and bring it up in five minutes? Like, Okay. Look at this. Make sure you have about five or six. There's some really good ones on here. Start going through. Do you want a few minutes to look through it? Yeah. Now, one more thing. For the most part, all of these are, are not quite big enough for a two-person two presentation. Um, I think they're all going to be single. But I'll give you a few minutes. Once you're going to go through or ask any questions, I did include H.H. H. Holmes on there because I'm not going to do talk to Watergate. And we will go into the randomizer. Yes. Oh, the reason I put the scream is even though it didn't happen here, it did affect here. It's one of the greatest art heists in, in, uh, in world history. For, the, for that, the painting, the scream was stolen. It just, it's an unbelievable story. Combination of, it's like blind luck, stupidity. Also good play. It's a good story. Yeah. Yeah. But you got to choose, so you just. Be, what if someone takes it? All right, we're on. All right, so get a piece of paper. I'm gonna throw it in the hallway. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, it'd be perfect because I got it. What do I got? <laughs> so, go ahead and look through the list. Go ahead and look through the list, and then I'll give you a few minutes to, to look at it, and then we will choose. I will do Watergate, and I'll do it after a few days. Not, a, I'm not going to be. It won't be that big of a unit. I've decided I'm going to watch a movie for this unit or not. Yes. I got to talk to Mr. Zarnowski. He always, he likes to show, or at least I think he did last year. I think he showed uh, all the president's men. Show about Watergate, and if he wants to do that again for AP government after the AP exam, I don't want to, don't want to duplicate it. No, I'll watch. I know, I'll try to give you a little more time, a little more time. Yeah. What is this for? Why am I wearing a poppy? Veterans Day. Veterans Day. Veterans Day. And when I, was a, when I was a kid, everyone still wore poppies. Today, you don't see that as much. In fact, since, you know, I, football, I was watching football yesterday. It seems like Veterans Day has now become an excuse to act like they support soldiers and then really just to sell $190 uniforms with really bad camouflage colors on them, which in a way really makes me sick. But that's what seems to be their idea of what they're doing. And But the poppy, it comes from, well, it's, it's November 11th. Why is Veterans Day November 11th? Yeah, it, it was originally Armistice Day. Then after World War II, it was changed to Veterans Day. In Canada and Britain, it became Remembrance Day. And if you're in Canada or Britain, they wear the poppy all, all for a month, every day, everybody. And that's why if you ever see a, a politician at that time, they always have a poppy for that reason. And so that's why they did that. And they thought it was, well, you know, World War I was more than all awards. And why poppies? Flanders. Hmm? Flanders, right? Yeah, that was like, it, it was a poppy. Well, Flattersville in northern Belgium is one, it's one of the areas where a lot of there were British casualties, and there was a poem by a, guy, a Canadian named John McRae yeah. where he mentions the poppies. But it also happened all over northern, northern Europe. All over northern Europe. What do poppies do? Whenever there's churned up soil, they grow really fast. White, yellow, and red. Just if there's churned up soil, poppies should like weeds just pop up. And they're amazing how fast they would be. Within a couple of days, it would go from being nothing more than just a little green stalk to being a flower, a flower, really fast, where, where you see a lot of churned up soil. 
Seven tables, freshly dug graves. They would be covered with poppies immediately. And so where, there, where they would bury soldiers as quickly as possible after the battle, they'd be covered with poppies. So that's where that comes from. So that's what it's supposed to remember. So that's why I'm wearing a poppy. So I, I, I like the old, I like that old tradition. Do any of our politicians like do that? Not really, not too long. It's, so what are we talking about back here? So let's go ahead then and we'll go through the list. And I'll give you a few minutes to have any questions. You can talk about it. maybe uh and I will, you know, if you pick first, maybe you can work out a deal where you could trade. I don't wanna we'll stop it. Okay, so leave. Let's get this done. <laughs> There's lots of really good ones. Make sure you pick a few. And it's time to be similar. If you have another idea for a presentation, No, we're going to do this. For assassinations, we're going to do a newspaper. What is Butch Cassidy's son? What is it? Yeah, the Butch Cassidy's son, they were, uh, they actually were part of a game called the Wild Fudge. And they would come infamous for some of the great train robberies in the 20th century, or late 19th century. And they hid out in, in Wyoming. They're in Montana. A bunch of them got caught on the way there. There's a picture up there. A bunch of them are in my own town, Miles City, but they went there too. But it's a great story. It's a really good story. And there's a, there's a pretty well known movie about it that is sometimes good and sometimes horrible. Has anyone seen it? It's sometimes really bad. Rain drops keep falling on my head. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. You know what I mean. It's a movie. It's got two great actors in it. Paul Newman and Robert Redford. No. There's a <laughs> oh, Richard's back is scary. Ted Bundy's a classic. There's some really good stories. There's actually two different night stalkers. And the one night there's actually two. I, I, I just remembered this. Okay, so there are two night stalkers. If you want to work together with somebody and do both night stalkers, because there are two, and one has just been caught from a crime back in the 1970s, and it's an amazing story involving Ancestry.com. Wow. I'm not kidding. And uh, but and then the other, I mean, it's the night stalker. I bet you're about the night stalker. You, have, you hear little bits when you're a kid. No, these are like, like, you know, like, 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 I miss Kim stuff at 17. Yeah. And I saw the first like, just was like, she thought she was like, she just wanted to turn herself into like, I like it. 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 I like Oh, Who's my favorites? They're all so much fun. You know, they're all really fun. 
I really want to see the Your game is terrible. Oh, yeah. We got perfect all really interesting. That's I got to be honest with you. Super sister, she was also filled with the I like the pattern. 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 I like the I like the I like the I try to listen, but I still remember. Oh uh, yeah. And, and, I I'm not going to sleep with you. I figured it was good. Nice songs. Are those recordings that he would send in? Oh. Do you know Wayne Williams? Do you know Wayne Williams? He was on the show for kids. Oh, that was, yeah, in Atlanta. He was on the show for two men. He met, like, like, every day, it seemed like there was another little boy in Berkeley. Wayne Williams? Every day in Atlanta. Every day, it just seemed to go on and, and on. And then when they did catch them, the ball, all the kids were black. So the black community felt like marginalized. <laughs> and they didn't catch them. They never convicted them for any of the children. The children. It was only the two men. And it's such, it's, it's, it's that one is really scary. It's oh, yeah. really scary. Wayne Williams. Wayne Williams. Yeah, Wayne Williams. That's a scary story. But that one too, because CNN was just brand new. You know, and they so they got that all, but they're, they're publicizing all the time. Cable television was just becoming a thing, so it was on TV all the time. Every day. Have you seen Mine Hunter? And I was junior. I was junior high age. Hmm? Have you seen Mine Hunter? I know that's on like Netflix or something. Yeah, it's it. probably the FBI is becoming kind of like behavior analysis unit. And like the big case is like those second is all about um, the Atlanta child murders. And it's not like the most accurate thing, but it is very interesting. It's pretty good. I've heard mixed about it. I've kept all where that might be. Oh, <laughs> yeah, they don't talk about it. I saw this thing online, uh, online about I didn't put that in there, but I don't know how it's out She killed, no one knows how to do it. Eileen, that's a good story. Nice. And that's for the whole hitchhiker thing, where all of a sudden every hitchhiker was a serial killer in the 1970s. Did you know Ed Kemper? Huh? The serial killer? He was psycho. Poet killer? Yeah. Who? Yeah, and that's why I, I decided not to have too many of that. Yeah. That's why I put on there. Um, but like, the legends are also not scary because he was like only like the like the like the guys who like the the But that's why I put. Yeah. Richard Speck. That's why I put Richard Speck. I only wanted one. I only wanted one killer of female students. I mean, yeah, I know there are different stories back. I only want one question. And Richard Speck, that was a bigger story with more nationwide. Yeah. 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 Yeah, he did that. I don't have that. Oh, I, I was just, nah, I don't know the story about that last night. Yeah. Okay, you did a nice surprise. I don't want too many presentations about it. Oh, <laughs> 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 so the highway is here. 
That's actually a British idea, but I put it on there. Because I wrote all these people these people No one has any idea what happened. And I couldn't see what I was going to make that a mystery or a murder by the time it's put in there. Yeah, really. What is Margot Robbie's name? Margot Robbie. 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 Margot Robbie